Hello and welcome to today's Curator's Choice Learn at Lunchtime program. I am Beth Erickson from the State Museum of Pennsylvania. Our topic today is archaeology and with us is Janet Johnson, Acting Senior Curator of Archaeology at the State Museum of Pennsylvania. Hello and thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Beth. So many of us remember Hurricane Sandy, a very destructive storm which struck the East Coast in 2012. Now, following that storm, there was a yacht club that was doing cleanup in the Delaware River near Bristol in Bucks County. And during this cleanup, they made a very unusual discovery that you're going to tell us about today. That's right, Beth. Thank you. The path of destruction created by Hurricane Sandy in October 2012 was very devastating to the area. And Bristol, which was 30 miles north of Philadelphia was impacted by this storm significantly with flooding and power outages. On November 10th, members of the Anchor Yacht Club of Bristol were pulling up their moorings when they made a remarkable discovery. Entangled in their moorings and in their anchors were several logs, which they proceeded to cut up in the cleanup process. One log stood out as having an iron tip on the end. And when this log was looked at closer, it was identified as an 18th century cheval de frise. The term cheval de frise is the singular form of chevaux de frise, which is derived from the French phrase meaning Friesland horses. This land obstruction was used by the people of Friesland, a section of Eastern Holland and Western Germany to offset deficiencies of their cavalry, which lacked horses. Historic documents of the American Revolutionary War indicate chevaux de frise were used on both the Delaware and Hudson rivers. They were designed to prevent or at a minimum slow passage of British ships on these rivers. The basic construction of all chevaux de frise was very similar, but their size and detail varied, primarily due to varying river depths. The Hudson River is much deeper near West Point, New York, as is the New York Bay, and required larger chevaux de frise than on the lower Delaware River. This cheval de frise was part of a series sunk in the Hudson River. The iron tip shown here extends 40 inches from the tip and is three and three quarters inches wide. Note the notches at the end of the tip. The Hudson was also protected by heavy chains installed across the river channel to block passage up the Hudson. Documentation indicates that some of these chains were made at Ringwood, New Jersey, the iron furnace of Robert Erskine, who submitted a design for the Chevaux de Frise. Ben Franklin wrote to Robert Erskine in October of 1776, to thank him for his offer of a design of a marine chevaux de frise, but it was determined that the soft floor of the Delaware River would make this design impractical. Erskine's design was submitted to Franklin almost a year after Pennsylvania had selected a design. Erskine was later appointed by Washington as the geographer or, and surveyor of roads for the Continental Army in 1777. He operated an iron forge in Ringwood, New Jersey, and may have supplied iron tips for the Cheval de Frise in addition to the chains on the Hudson. One of these land obstructions in the Delaware River that was attributed to Ben Franklin and the Pennsylvania Committee of Safety. And minutes from the Committee of Safety addressed sinking the Cheval de Frise opposite Fort Mifflin in 1775. Smith's design was implemented in 1775 and the first frames completed by the end of August. His design, which was selected by the Committee of Safety, presented challenges for installation due on the Delaware due to the shifting channel shoals and sandbars, which would hinder placement. The deeper pass between Billingsport and Billings Island was narrower than the passage between Fort Mifflin and the New Jersey shore. 
It was originally felt that the ships couldn't pass on the East Channel along a large shoal, but this was disproven by Washington and a late somewhat misaligned effort to block the Eastern Channel was devised. No panel of Smith's design for the Chevaux de Frise, no plan of it has been discovered, but a 1778 map depicts a, sim a design similar to that illustrated in historic documents. Smith was concerned during the construction that the Cheval were not being constructed as sturdily as he had planned. Initial costs were estimated at 1,700 pounds for 17 Chevaux de Frise, 100 pounds each. Documents indicate that at least 7,706 pounds were paid, 453 pounds for each, but more than 17 were constructed. Installation didn't begin until 1776 with the first at Billingsport, considered the lower line of defense, to be placed 60 feet distance from center to center of each of them and at a height where there would be no more than six feet of water over them at low tide. Assistance was lent to New York in 1776 for installation of their Chevaux de Frise, which influence construction and installation of Pennsylvania's line. To ensure that the supplies were available in New York when the carpenters arrived, they uh, identified the need for 25 to 30 log from 40 to 65 feet in length and 12 to 26 inches thick in the butts for each of the Chevaux de Frise to be sunk in the river. Additional information provided from Smith's report in 1775 describes frames constructed in varying sizes of 14 to 23 feet high. The frames were built at Gloucester and floated and sunk in the main channel near Hog Island and Fort Mifflin. Varying heights would allow for the maximum exposure of the iron spear tips at low tide. Heavy anchors were used to lower the empty frames to the riverbeds and secure them in place while stone ballasts were lowered in the crib of the frame. 15 to 20 tons of stone were used to secure the smaller frames and as much as 40 to 50 tons in larger frames. Stone was ferried in flat boats from quarries on the upper Schuylkill River. Sandstone and diabase occur on the upper Schuylkill and likely is the quarried rock used. Construction and installation took place over 27 months from 1775 to late 1777, just prior to the British attacks on the Delaware in November, 1777. Washington had positioned his troops expecting Howe to march into Philadelphia via Delaware. Philadelphia was the largest city in North America with a population of nearly 30,000. It was a critical supply point, especially for the military and how instead of moving through Maryland, in, instead of moving through Philadelphia, how moved through Maryland foraging for food and provisions. Washington watched his movements and positioned his troops near Chad's Ford along the Brittywine River. Loyalists and spies had likely aided in Howe's advance. On September 11, 1777, the Battle of Brandywine occurred, which saw Continental troops forced to retreat. The British troops plundered Quaker farms, taking provisions and damaging crops. Again, on, 17, on September 23, 1777, Washington ordered that every dock vessel in the River Delaware between Market Street Wharf and Burlington be by the next tide of flood taken up to Burlington and put under the care of the naval officer commanding there. All that are found afloat or on the shore on the Pennsylvania side of the river 24 hours after publishing these orders will be destroyed. For nearly six weeks in the fall of 1777, American troops in Fort Mifflin and Fort Mercer frustrated British naval attempts to resupply their occupying forces in Philadelphia. Howe would need to defeat these forts in order to gain full access to the river. Fort Mercer was located on the New Jersey side and Fort Mifflin was situated on the, on the Pennsylvania side near the mouth of the Schuylkill River.
British troops gained control in early October and began the task of dismantling the lower Chevaux de Frise. The removal of this line of defense in early November widened the passage and allowed British ships through the lower portion of the river. Howe could focus his troops on Fort Mercer and Fort Mifflin. Fort Mercer was attacked by Hessian and British troops at the Battle of Red Bank on October 22, 1777, and this battle became an embarrassment for British forces who suffered significant losses. Guarded by 400 American soldiers, it was attacked by 1,200 British and Hessian troops. Six British men of war were engaged by smaller American gunboats on the Delaware River, and during the engagement, two of the ships, the 64-gun ship of line Augusta and the sloop of war Merlin ran aground on a shoal trying to avoid the Chevaux de Frise. Unable to move the Merlin off the shoal, it was set on fire to keep it from falling to American forces. The Augusta was set on fire by American batteries from Fort Mifflin. Howe reinforced his troops and again attacked in early November starting with Fort Mifflin, an account of the British bombardment of Fort Mifflin on November 10, 1777, identified the following gunpowder. We opened our batteries against Bud Island for the whole consisting of two 32 pounders, six 24 pounders, one 18 pounder, pounder, two eight inch mortars and one 13 inch mortar. For five days, 2,000 British troops shot over 10,000 cannon shells at the fort. Cold, ill, and starving, the garrison of 400 men at Fort Mifflin refused to give up. Their efforts at Fort Mifflin held the British Navy at bay and allowed Washington and his troops time to arrive safely at Valley Forge. Fort Mifflin eventually fell to the British forces on November 15th, but not without putting up a fight. Fort Mercer, which was manned with fewer troops, was abandoned on November 18th as Cornwallis's 2,000 troop support approached. Howe had full control of the Delaware and Philadelphia. It was a short occupation for the British, who left Philadelphia after the French joined the American effort in the spring of 1778. Just to recap, the Chevaux de Frey are installed from July 1777 until August 1777. In November of 1777, Fort Mifflin and Fort Mercer are attacked and troops retreat. In, in 1778, the British leave Philadelphia. And in 1784, the removal of the Chevaux begins. This is a, a map again showing the area uh, of where these battles of, have occurred around Fort Mifflin and Fort Mercer and the gold star being Bristol. The discovery of this Cheval de Frise at Bristol is puzzling. None of the documents point to a direct link to this artifact. How had it survived for 235 years on the river bottom? 30 miles north of Philadelphia, not close to the location of the Chabot installed near the forts. Bristol was established in 1681 and was tied to the Penn Charter, thus sharing the same date as the establishment of the Commonwealth, leading to its early settlement. During the Revolutionary War, it housed the southern third of George Washington's army during the Delaware Crossing Campaign in December of 1776. Radcliffe Street in Bristol housed Cadwalder's army and several homes were converted for use by troops and included a big house, hospital, and quarters. Bristol's location across from Burlington, New Jersey likely factored into its significance. A ferry operated between Burlington and Bristol transporting troops and Bristol was also on the west side of Burlington Island, which is the shipping lane of the Delaware at this location. A militia was formed at Bristol and regularly patrolled and manned a cannon on the riverbank. British troops captured Bristol during the winter of 1777 in a surprise attack in the middle of the night. Bristol was noted in the late 1700s for its shipbuilding capabilities. While no documents point to the installation of a chevaux de frise at Bristol, 
It seems plausible that some attempt was made to block the advance of the British Navy on the west side of the river. The Revolutionary War moved out of the Delaware River Valley and the need for a line of defense slipped away, just like the British soldiers. Shipping was hindered on the Delaware by the Chevaux and in a 1784 plan was put in place to remove all that could be located. 63 frames were reportedly removed from July to October of 1784 by the contractors. Interestingly, a note from September indicates that 14 not pre quote, not previously discovered were found and removed. Reportedly, some Chevaux were destroyed on the shore that had never been sunk in the river. No record accounts for all that were built <clears throat> and sunk. Again, the difficulty in determining if this was, quote, a loose cannon at Bristol or an installation that was kept out of the historic record. These are some of the examples of Cheval de Frise removed from the Delaware. And if you'll note, these have an angular notch um, on the wooden log. They're angled at the end before the metal tip is applied. And these are some of the crib frames, again, from the Delaware River. And some of the points that have been recovered that are on display at Fort Mifflin, the iron tips. You can see that these are rather large straps on these iron tips. And again, note the notching on that iron tip. This is an example of a Cheval de Frise that was recovered um, during the Sunoco Logistics Pier project in 2007. This example, as in others observed, measures between 12 and 14 inches in diameter. The length of these, this piece measures just over 11 feet. Comparing this to the example from Bristol, the diameter of the splayed end on the Bristol Cheval is 13.6 inches and the diameter tapers to 6.2 inches. Its length just under 29 inches. 29 inches, or 29 feet, I'm sorry, as opposed to 11 feet at, on, on this one from the lower Delaware. We received the call in January of 2013 to examine the Cheval. And this is looking at it along the Delaware River at low tide. There it is again at low tide. You can see there's other debris along the river banks there. And the Cheval, we had it, um, the Yacht Club leave it in the water so that it could uh, help to preserve it until we were able to, to examine the piece and determine its best approach. We removed the Cheval in March of that year to take it to Pensbury Manor where it would be housed until we were able to uh, have it conserved. One possibility suggested by the curator at the Independent Seaport Museum is that this Cheval was used in sequestering of the frigates Effingham and Washington, which were 32 gun warships under construction by the Continental Navy in Philadelphia. These ships were moved upriver to Burlington to keep them from falling into British hands. The lighter weight Chevaux were fastened to the river bottom to protect these ships and the colonial ports of Bristol, Burlington, Bordentown, and Trenton is our uh, plausible explanation for these. Washington had ordered the ships sunk to prevent them from falling into British control, the Effingham and the Washington, and recall the earlier citation of his orders. But the desire was to just keep the ships from being um, uh, taken into British control. So sinking them without destroying them was the option that was chosen. And again, with Bristol being an important shipbuilding area, it, they could have been uh, preserved and pulled back up and put back into service. Removal from the Delaware River and transport to Pensbury Manor for the winter, again, to keep the ice from uh, destroying it. And there you can see the iron tip. And you note again, the smaller 
girth of this uh, cheval, the log itself. Here it is in the boat house at Pinsbury Manor awaiting conservation treatment. We wrapped it in plastic and ran water over it to keep it wet and removal from a wet environment would have caused the deterioration of the corroded tip and displayed log. We also included Lysol in order to keep mold growth down. In the spring, we packaged it. We hired a contractor to help transport it to East Carolina University um, for the underwater program lab and conservation lab at East Carolina in Greenville, North Carolina. Here it is at Greenville. And this is the large tank that was prepared for it, again, so that it could be soaked in um, water baths that remove salts from the wood before treatment in a polyethyl glycol, which is referred to as PEG solution. This controlled absorption allowed for a gradual replacement of moisture in the wood with a PEG solution, helping to prevent further splitting and fragmenting of the wood post. The iron tip was treated separately with a corrosion inhibitor and coated to prevent further deterioration. This treatment was completed in November of 2014. The wood was examined under high magnification and determined to be oak. These are drawings profiles again. And you note the difference in the shape of this cheval. It is not angled as were those um, shown to you in earlier images. And again, during conservation, the iron um, Langlets or tip strips along there and damage to those that had been incurred. This is the reproduction iron at the Independent Seaport Museum at the top and the reproduction iron tip that was created and put on our cheval prior to installation at Brandywine as we determined that the original iron tip had corroded to the point that it was no longer stable and worthy of exhibit. So we have that in a special preservation uh, tank. And then this one is on the uh, reproduction is on the tip. The preservation of this incredible discovery was a momentous task. This is important as this is the tangible evidence of our past viewing this quote, big pointy stick evokes a sense of awe that these early colonists were tenacious in their efforts to defend these lands and waters. Manual labor and heroic efforts allowed us to complete the task of driving the British out of Philadelphia and eventually gain our independence. We can't definitely identify the use of this Cheval de Frise, but its story is preserved for future generations to uncover its secret. And this is the Cheval on display at Brandywine Battlefield. Brandywine is currently closed, but if you um, want to visit them, go to the brandywinebattlefield.org website for additional information about the uh, reopening. Thank you, Janet, so much for sharing this information. We are going to we're going to take some questions from the audience. Um, let's see. If you have a question, please type it in the Q&A box and we will get to as many as we can. So our first question, have there been any underwater surveys of the Delaware River to look for more Cheval de Fries? There was a survey conducted by an underwater archeologist, Lee Cox in 1984. Um, <clears throat> they used remote sensing and a diving team, and they did identify um, some of the ships that had been burned. There were over 40 ships that were burned and sunk by the British as they were exiting out of Philadelphia um, and north up into uh, Burlington, New Jersey. So uh, they have identified some of these, but again, there is ongoing dredging going on in the uh, Delaware River. Um, and uh, these keep appearing, these keep coming up to the surface. Is there any record of Cheval's impacting modern boats using the waterways? No, 
Now there have not been any uh, records of them impacting them or damaging the modern ships. Uh, there have been some other, um, when they had steamboats and paddle boats on the Delaware, there were some records of just some of the debris. They didn't identify what the debris was damaging some of those paddle boats. And a couple other questions. Um, what is the function of the notches in the iron? Again, they would have, um, that notch would have pierced into the wood of the hull of the ship that, in, in this case, the British ships. Um, and that would have ensured that it would have hung in there, if you will, um, and hung up the ship. Remember the original intention of these is to slow the advance of, um, of troops. And you, so you want that ship to be hung up so that others cannot proceed. Has there been a dendro date conducted on this? Not on this particular um, log. No, there was not a dendro date conducted on it. We have a question about uh, why it was found where it was found. It, could the Chavot have been washed up river from Philadelphia to Bristol? Not likely for it to have been washed 30 miles north. Um, again, th the main thing about this Cheval is that it is much larger, longer. It is not as robust around the girth of the log. Um, when you compare uh, the logs that were found, the Cheval de Fries that were found in the lower Delaware, um, down near Fort Mifflin and Fort Mercer, those are much more substantial. Uh, this likely might have uh, snapped had it encountered some of those larger ships. So again, if it was just for slowing the advancement um, up near Bristol, and we know that uh, the main larger ships are going into Philadelphia, um, it may have just been uh, sufficient for that uh, area north of Philadelphia. What other artifacts have been recovered from the rivers around Philadelphia? Cannonballs, <clears throat> iron, um, gun parts. Um, there have been any number of things recovered and a lot of those, um, again, um, things that were on ship, but also supplies that when the British were attacking um, and at Fort Mercer and Fort Mifflin both, they were uh, discarding um, materials that they had at those forts so that they would not fall into British hands. So they were throwing those into the, into the river as well. The artifact, the artifact appeared to be very well preserved. Why didn't it rot or decay in the water? Water creates an anaerobic environment. So that, pre, that acts as a uh, preservation environment for wood artifacts and removing it from the water is when it begins to deteriorate. So that was why it was so important that we keep this wet the whole time. Uh, and again, the efforts to remove the water and uh, salines, the uh, salts and acids that are in the wood, make it a neutral environment and replace it with that polyethyl uh, glycol, the PEG treatment that helped to preserve the wood. How did the civilian ships or boats know to avoid the installation of the Cheval de Fris? There were a lot of spies in Philadelphia and loyalists. And we believe that they were working um, to provide Howe and his troops with information that allowed them to know where the placement was. And again, uh, placement of these, they were so large and it took so much effort to install them that uh, people would easily have seen where they were being installed. Um, so sharing that information with his with house troops and with the British forces from the Loyalists would not have been difficult. Did any British ships actually try to reach the shipyard at Bristol? 
We do not have a record of that. But again, when they abandon Philadelphia in the spring, they do advance up through Bristol. And that is when they're, they burn a number of ships up through that area as they're advancing and going up uh, Burlington and further up the Delaware. In some of the slides, there was picture of debris on the shoreline that seemed kind of squarish. Is that part of the frame? That was, no, that was not part of the frame. That was um, a diff, uh, additional timbers that had just been washed up during uh, Hurricane Sandy. And when the people found it during the, after the storm, did they contact the State Museum directly? Uh, the listener is curious about what is to be done if an artifact is found somewhere. In this particular case, the um, Yacht Club actually contacted their local historical society who thought that that was likely what it was, a Cheval de Fries. And then they contacted the uh, Pennsylvania Historical and Museum Commission and the call then was passed down to archeology. span Anything found in the waters of the Commonwealth is property of the Commonwealth um, because um, that's how the waterways are deemed in Pennsylvania. If you find an artifact, we encourage you to contact um, either the archeologist within the museum commission at State Museum or at the State Historic Preservation Office who can enable you to record their, the uh, location of the artifact and identify what it is. And the question about, did any of the obstructions result in the sinking of any British ships? While the uh, Augusta was um, damaged by the Cheval, it did not actually sink, but again, it was um, the two ships that were damaged by the Cheval uh, near Fort Mifflin were then destroyed, one by British troops and the other, the Augusta, by um, the Continental Army. All right, we have another question about the wood. What wood was used for the Cheval? That was an oak log. Oak uh, was probably one of the better choices. Not only was Pennsylvania using oak though for its shipbuilding industry, um, because it was again, a very durable wood, but use of that in um, constructing the Chevals would have been helpful because again, oak is a strong wood, stronger than your your softwoods, your pines, and it would have been abundant along the Delaware River Valley. So it was more of a uh, availability choice. Availability choice, but again, uh, the oak would have been a better choice than your pines. Uh, we have a question regarding um, where something's found, specifically in the Delaware. So if an artifact, what if the artifact was brought up on the New Jersey side? is the dividing line through the middle of the Delaware. How is something determined whether it belongs to Pennsylvania or if it belongs to New Jersey? <laughs> well, again, we work with the New Jersey office uh, on these um, finds from the Delaware River. And essentially, if it's on the shores of Pennsylvania, we identify it as, again, um, being in the waters of the Commonwealth on the shores. If it's in the middle, uh, <laughs> we would probably have to evaluate and uh, determine, you know, uh, I, I believe that there is a, a line in there, kind of an arbitrary line um, that was determined, but we would work with um, the New Jersey Historic Preservation Office as well. All right, I think that is all our questions for today. There's lots of thank yous and appreciation for a great presentation, Janet, and I thank you as well. Thank you everybody for your questions. And if you wanna explore more about this topic or other topics related to Pennsylvania, visit the State Museum of Pennsylvania's website. The links are in the chat box. There are 
also links in there for our archaeology section. And um, thank you, Janet, again so much for this, for sharing this research um, in the program today, and especially also for the information regarding um, what to do if you find something you suspect might be an artifact. You're quite welcome. Thank you. All right. And for those who are um, interested in attending more Learn at Lunchtime programs, we have listings coming up. Um, if you would like to join us again, please visit our website for more program information and to sign up. Today's program was recorded and will be available on the PHMC YouTube page. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Thank you again to Janet, and have a great day.